Now, in this, uh, in this part of the dialogue, that is Theotetus 143d to 147d, we're digging a little bit more into the, the central aspect of uh, what the dialogue's about, namely, to jump ahead, it's about knowledge. What is knowledge? So at 143d, Socrates uh, is, uh, says that he's on the hunt for young Athenian men. Um, and this is what a lot of Athenian nobles used to do. They used to seek out uh, young men in a variety of ways. Um, and there's all kinds of scholarship on, on Greek sexuality, homosexuality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and, and some of their questionable sexual practices. Certainly what we would today regard as deeply questionable, if not simply outright illegal. So, but I'm going to put that uh, to the side for now because there's a, there's a ton of literature on this. And I'm not really focused on it on, on it on it here. But if you're interested, there's you know easy stuff to look up, lots of stuff on it. Um, but now we're introduced to some of our characters. So Socrates is on the scene now. Uh, uh, Theodorus uh, is uh, the the old mathematician now. He's the teacher of Theotetus, and Theodorus is uh, uh, says that. Um, you know, I'm comfortable about praising the young Theotetus because um, he, as, as Theodorus says to Socrates, he kind of reminds me of you, Socrates. He's a really smart guy and pretty ugly. Uh, he's basically kind of a snub-nosed and bug-eyed. And so my praising of him, you won't think that I'm just praising him because he's this fine-looking young fellow. You'll realize that my praise is seriously meant. So what's the point of that? Well that true intelligence is going to be independent, kind of in a way, of, of physical beauty. Or, you, can, you could spin it this way, that true beauty is intelligence. And that's more of a platonic way of reading it, because uh, the true sense of beauty is not something physical. True beauty is something that uh, we use as a concept to recognize physical beauty. So yeah, beauty's only skin deep. Uh, but real beauty is something conceptual, and it deals with harmony and form and, and things like that, as opposed to just regular old things in the world. Those are not truly beautiful, according to Plato. They can exemplify their, or, or capture some small sense of true beauty, but they themselves are temporary and therefore not true beauty in and of themselves. And Theodorus says, not only is this guy kind of homely, so he reminds me of you, Socrates, but he's one of the few youths that, that Theodorus says, you know, is, is really well-grounded. And he uses the metaphor of, uh, instead of being well-grounded physically, uh, he's like a ship with ballast in it. That, you know, it's, it's balanced and, you know, he can handle all kinds of things in life, whereas young people... Uh, Theodorus says, don't tend to be like that. They tend to be a little bit more rambunctious. But so you've got a good kid to work with here if you want to talk to a smart young guy, uh, says uh, Theodorus, that Theotetus will be uh, your guy. And he's stable-minded. So uh, Theodorus is, uh, you know, he makes a, a comparison, you know, the physical, that, that is, he makes a comparison between Theotetus and Socrates that's Physical, they're both kind of homely, and uh, a deeper, more soul-like one, that they're kind of kindred spirits. So, yeah, this is the guy that you should go talk to. Um, now, Socrates uh, uh, says, okay, he uh, considers these kinds of comparisons, and then starts off the conversation, starts the conversation off with a, a, a nod about, and, and he's leading towards knowledge, but he compares, like, you know, um, well... Wait a second. If you're making a comparison between me and uh, uh, and 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 Theotetus, let's think about comparing things. Right? If you compare two musical instruments and whether they are are tuned the same or not, who should we really go talk to? So if you have two musical instruments and you're asking questions about them, are they tuned the same? Are they equal quality? Or et cetera, et cetera. Who should you talk to? This is an old Platonic argument. Well. You don't just talk to anybody because it's a question of knowledge, right? What, uh, uh, you know, are they both equally good instruments or, or whatever? You go and talk to someone who is knowledgeable. So this is uh, the standard platonic argument of uh, the link between sort of accreditation, authority, and knowledge. So knowledge is not just this democratic thing that, that uh, we say everybody just has. No, knowledge is the result of training. So knowledge just doesn't 
come to us. It's a product of uh, training. So it's not something that we just automatically all have. It's somehow, we can say, linked uh, with, with authority. It's not exact, it's not identical, but it's connected. And authority is connected with some kind of process of learning. So on this notion of learning, Socrates is going to run with it a little bit. And um, he says things like, okay, well, let's, uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's examine this the Theotetus kid, right? And um, we're going to get to know each other, he says to Theotetus. Now, here's another interesting, so we say, social dimension of, uh, uh, of the Greeks. And it's uh, a notion of friendship and getting to know people. Now, this is quite different than we, the way we would see it. You know, today, if, if uh, people get to know each other, uh, or if they claim that they know each other, what do they usually, you know, if you claim that you know your friend, if I say, you know, how do you know your friend? Uh, uh, you know, what, what, what would be evidence for you saying that you know your friend? Now, at the risk of, of generalizing, and but we today often would say things like, well, I don't know, I know, what, I know what his favorite color is or that he likes chocolate ice cream or something like that. You might list a bunch of, shall we say, pretty ordinary properties that would constitute your knowing the person. You know what kind of car they drive, you know, the, you know where they live, et cetera, et cetera, the music that they like. And, and you would say, yeah, we, we, we share an interest in cars or we share an interest in chocolate ice cream or whatever. But notice these kinds of properties. These are sort of everyday, arguably fairly mundane properties. That's not how Socrates thought that you actually got to know someone. With Socrates, it's more like, I'm going to get to know you by solving a math problem with you. I'm going to get to know you through a philosophical investigation because that's how I really get to the essence of who you are. So think about if you transplanted that into the modern world of getting to know people, you wouldn't care about their everyday likes or dislikes or whatever. That would be largely irrelevant because those are accidental. You know, you just happen to like chocolate ice cream. If your parents had have raised you slightly different, you might be a big fan of, I don't know, pistachio or strawberry. So who cares about your love of chocolate ice cream or whatnot? I'm more interested in what are the real necessary properties about you. And those important necessary properties are going to be the deeper things. You know, what do you think about truth and justice? Now imagine if you met someone and say, yeah, I'd like to get to know you. What, what do you think truth is? What do you think justice is? Uh, let's solve a math problem together. That probably would be, you know, rather odd to most people, but that's what we're working with. That's Socrates. Now, he says, um, um, let's, let's do an abstract kind of puzzle and let's work together and that's how we'll become close. We're going to shed these ordinary things that keep people separate and that's how we'll approach truth together. That's very, that's very platonic, is, is two souls working together, you know, independently of all the externalities and the trappings of life on route or in pursuit of truth. Now, Socrates says, he raises a puzzle. He says, we're talking about 145D, so around 145 D, so around 145D, there's a little puzzle Socrates talks about. And he uh, says, you know, to learn, well, I guess I'll put it around here, 145D, there we go, that's better. So when we're learning something, learning X, whatever X happens to be, we're not too worried about that yet. Um, when you're learning something, you're becoming wiser about it. And this notion of becoming wiser, there was a certain kind of you know, important property that the mind could have, or a function it could have, or a capacity. We're not gonna worry too much about all the terminology, but an ability, right? Um, and in this case, it's wisdom, or in, in, in Greek, Sophia. Now, Sophia is this thing that just makes us wise. Now, how do you become, how do you get into this sort of state or this capacity? Um, you're, you're learning things. So you got to do some learning. You want to become wise. You got to do some learning. Well, Sophia seems then, Socrates says, it seems to be knowledge. Okay, so there's our, our real, you know, knowledge is now appearing. Knowledge, in other words, episteme in the original Greek. Sometimes 
And I've, I've, I, I recommend quite often, you know, not sometimes, but often, it's good to learn just the, the Greek terms, keep them in their original spelling, just keeps you aware that these documents, these platonic dialogues are from a long time ago when we, uh, when people had, you know, different understandings of words. So in the sense that if you use wisdom and knowledge, you're going to carry along all the standard connotations that you may have that might be quite idiosyncratic to your own personal learning history. So if you think of this pursuit of episteme rather than just knowledge, it can help keep you focused that this is an, a, a very ancient document that we're reading and people had different understandings. And then you can let the discussion unravel before you on its own without bringing too many of your own prejudices to it. All right, so it seems then this in these preliminary conceptual connections right at the beginning in the gymnasium, we're going to get together, we're talking about something abstract, yeah, this little puzzle about knowledge and wisdom. It seems to be that to know something is to be wise about it. So there's this link between Sophia and Episteme. And then Socrates says, well, if Sophia is becoming learned about something, what are we talking about when we're learning? And learning is to acquire knowledge. So we come up with our first and big question. What is this episteme that we're talking about? What is uh, uh, this thing that is going to be so important in becoming wiser or whatnot? Now, keep in mind that, that Plato's use of the term episteme involves a number of complicated factors, and we'll be teasing those out as we go along. But just to give you a little idea, one of the contrasts that's often pointed out in, between Aristotle and some of his successors, like his most famous student, uh, uh, or, or between Plato and Aristotle, is, is that Plato has more terms bound up with each other that Aristotle later on separates. So for Aristotle, yeah, uh, we see episteme turns up, so if you look at some of his works, like in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle talks about intellectual virtues. So he breaks all this stuff up into way more concepts, and he analyzes them in detail. He embeds them in the notion of a virtue. So you've got things like techne, episteme, phronesis, sophia, nous. You can see some of these in Plato's writings as well, but Aristotle really lays all this out in a lot more detail and analyzes it. So again, as I mentioned earlier, this dialogue of Plato's, this Theotetus is an important dialogue in, in Western thought. Aristotle, no doubt, was familiar with it and would have you know, tried to expand on it and respond to it in a lot of ways. So we've got our little puzzle, 145. This is opening up our dialogue. It brings in episteme. And so he says, all right, my good friend, my young friend, the Theotetus, Socrates says, what is episteme? What are we talking about? I'm puzzled by this. Can you help me out? And Theotetus gives us, at around 146D, his first response to, and I'll just use a, an asterisk, right? That's the asterisk indicating this question. That's our main question of the dialogue. What's, what's episteme? What's knowledge? But uh, Socrates says, can you answer this? And Theotetus says, yeah, sure, I can, I can answer that. And at 146D, he gives us our first, uh, and he's going to give a series of them. So this, again, tells you how the dialogue's going to uh, unfold. And what he does is he provides uh, examples of episteme. So Socrates says, what's episteme? And the first response by Theotetus is, well, here's a bunch of examples of it. So he enumerates, right? Basically, you can just think of it as, he lists a bunch of examples. So if I say, you know, uh, what does the term dog mean? And I just give you examples of dogs. Well, there's a German Shepherd, there's a St. Bernard, there's a Schnauzer, there's a water dog, etc., etc. So I just list examples. And um, so that's Theotetus' first response. And Socrates says, and this is the standard pattern, Socrates says, thank you very much for that response. Let's now examine it and see uh, what we can do with it, if anything, and how it holds up. Socrates will give us a little taste of his method here. Later on in the dialogue, actually very, very soon, he will give us a more detailed 
uh, discussion of his methodology. But stay tuned for that. That's in a later video. So Theotetus says, look, what are some examples of, of epistemic? Well, it's the stuff that my teacher, Theodorus, uh, uh, does. And what does Theodorus teach? Well, he does uh, things like geometry, astronomy. Uh, so those are examples. So you got geometry, astronomy in there. So things that are, we would normally think of as things you study. So geometry, astronomy. But things that are a little bit different. Uh, are also thrown in or enumerated as examples of episteme. Other things like uh, uh, shoe cobbling, so crafts or skills. So cobbling. So in other words, crafts or skills. Aristotle will, will look at that and those will be more or less lumped under things like techne. But uh, at this point, it's just being offered like epistemic, yeah, sure, things you learn, you study, areas of study, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and uh, various kinds of, uh, of, of skills, the crafts. Socrates then says, okay, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. He said, I asked you for one thing. What is epistemic? What is it? Right? What is this thing I'm asking about? Just, just tell me what it is. But what did you do? You gave me a list. I asked for one thing and I got many. So I wanted one, but you gave me many. That's not what I'm, so you got, you kind of got the form of the question wrong, right? I'm looking for one thing, I got a list of a whole pile of things. Another thing, not only did you give me a whole pile of things when I asked for one thing, I didn't really ask for examples. So in one sense, Socrates, who always says, oh, I, I know nothing, I'm ignorant, etc., etc., he's not. He knows what he's up to. He may be ignorant of some things, but he's not ignorant of everything. So Socrates is going to shape the answer that he wants. He may not know the content of it, and we'll see whether or not how that goes, but he definitely, shall we say, knows the shape or the kind of form. So right away he's saying, nope. I asked, I'm, the shape of my question is, is it's asking for one thing. You betrayed that shape by giving me a plurality. I wanted a unity, you gave me a plurality. Second thing, look, I asked you to answer this, like to fill in the blank here. Knowledge is, fill the blank in. But what you did is you, you gave me an answer, knowledge of, like knowledge is, knowledge of astronomy, knowledge is, instead of giving me a certain thing, you gave me knowledge of, knowledge of, knowledge of. I'm asking the question that's based on knowledge is something, give me that something that it is, not knowledge of, right? So Socrates says at the end of the day, that was a good try, lad, you know, and, and uh, don't feel bad about it, but that's not what I'm looking at. I'm not, I'm, 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 you're saying, you know, uh, uh, knowledge of all these other things, but I'm looking for one specific thing. Now, it seems that we have some kind of idea, you know, like if, if we must have some sort of idea of what knowledge is in order to rule out certain kinds of responses. So it's not the case that we have no clue as to what's going on, because at least Socrates is not debating that uh, astronomy is an example of knowledge. He's not debating that uh, shoe cobbling is an example of knowledge. So in some sense, we all kind of know what knowledge is. So maybe we have an implicit or kind of unclear or maybe even innate or whatnot. Those doors are open. So we have some kind of concept of what knowledge is and we're just trying to clarify it. So in that sense, we are not totally, uh, totally out of bounds. It's not like someone asking us uh, what something is and you don't even recognize the word at all. Like, you know, and notice that Theotetus doesn't say episteme. I've never heard this word. What are you talking about? Uh, so there's nothing like that. So Theotetus is saying, yeah, okay, I've heard this term knowledge and we all agree at least 
how the term is used. So it's, it's Socrates is not saying, hey, you're not even using the grammar of the word correct. He's not making any of those criticisms. He's just saying that uh, I wanted a unity, I wanted, and not, and not a list of examples. So you can think of the first one, the enumeration approach, or the enumerates of examples of, of episteme as a failed approach. Socrates then says, okay, I'm going to give you a hand. I'm going to help you out a little bit here. I'm going to uh, uh, give a little bit of, of some kind of shape to this question. And it is sometimes referred to as the clay answer. So Socrates first says, I want one, not many. And to give you a little help, I'm going to give you a, a, a say, like if I said, what's clay? You wouldn't give me examples of, of clay. Right? That's not going to be, you know, clay from this mountain, clay from that mountain. That's not going to be helpful. So Socrates then says, he offers this clay definition. And what, and this definition of clay, very simple. He says something like this, it's just earth mixed with water. So earth plus water. Okay. Right? So, Clay is not turning up in the definition. It's not, you're not giving examples of it. You're unpacking it, right? You're subdividing or articulating or unpacking. Whatever term you want to use for now is fine, but it's the idea of dissecting, crawling inside this concept and trying to elucidate its inner parts. Well, it seems to be it's earth plus water. So we can think of clay as being defined, right? So, defined. Uh, as earth and water. So Socrates is giving him some hints. He's giving him some leading questions. Okay, this is kind of what I'm looking for. Not that, not that. Yeah, along these lines. And um, so Socrates also uh, glosses over some distinctions, right? Because remember, if you go back here, in the enumerative examples of episteme, we had more of, shall we say, things we normally say as studying, and other things as cobbling. Well, Socrates doesn't quite make the distinction that we often make now. Philosophers would often say, well, this is an, an example of knowledge that, and this is knowledge how. So these are different kinds of, of uh, notions of knowledge, knowing how, knowing that. Like, I know how to skate, but I can't. Like, think about riding a bicycle. You know how to ride a bike, or maybe, or, or tying your shoes, or whatever. There might be lots of things that you know how to do, but you'd be hard-pressed to say exactly how you did it. So, but it is a kind of knowledge. So Socrates glosses over that. Today, we often distinguish uh, between knowing how and knowing that. So there are some things that are just kind of, you know, run over and, and, and let go here. But let's go back to the clay example. He says, that's what I'm after. I want to see something like that. Clay, clay is water and earth. And um, after this, you know, Theotetus says, oh, okay, 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 I, I think I'm, yeah, this makes a little more sense now. I think I know what you're after. Now, keep in mind, Socrates is talking to a kid. He's talking to a very young man, about 16 years old. So this is a, a, a young guy. He's a smart kid, but... You know, he's still learning. So Socrates is pretty gentle with him, and he doesn't introduce all the high-powered machinery that he often introduces in, uh, Socrates often introduces in other dialogues. But he's trying to lead him, he's trying to teach him. So you can also think of this dialogue as a manual for teachers, how to teach, how it's a pedagogy, uh, an exercise in pedagogy, we could say. So, Theotetus says something like this, okay, yeah, I see what you mean now. And you know what? Your discussion, Theotetus says, uh, this, this clay thing and, and this more one not many, this reminds me of something that my teacher, Theodorus, has talked about. And Theodorus was just telling us recently, so now we have a memory, another memory, now it's Theotetus' memory, so a memory inside of the dialogue. Theotetus says, yeah, I remember uh, my, my teacher talking about a certain investigation he was after, um, the mathematician, Theodorus, he's a geometer, but, and the Greeks did not really completely distinguish between geometry and arithmetic the way we do now. They often lump numbers and geometry and geometric concepts together. 
I'll go into a little more detail about this discussion, this mathematical discussion, but I want to give you an idea right now of what's sort of the takeaway and how it relates to what's happened so far. Here, Theotetus says that Theodorus was working on the question of, of powers. These, this is a, in, in mathematics. These powers are just certain numbers. Right? Not all numbers, just a certain kind of number, a special kind of class of numbers. So if you imagine all the numbers and then you imagine a subset or a subclass, uh, those particular class, they have special kinds of properties. Those are called powers. And this is the key to the whole sort of structure, shall we say, of the answer that Socrates wants. Because Theodorus had been working with powers and he managed to define they he managed to uh, define them. So that's your key. The kind of definition that Socrates is looking for is very similar to what mathematicians do when they try to identify and define particular objects that they work with. So it's a very abstract enterprise. You're looking primarily what you're looking for when you want to define something is and it relates back, so it ties back to the examples. So when you want to define something like knowledge, and you want to relate it to, the, to mathematics, when you're defining knowledge, or as we saw, episteme, you will have all your examples. So example one, example two, dot, 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 dot example uh, you know, whatever, n, which is n standing for an arbitrary number. What you're trying to do is get beyond this and say, okay, why are these particular instances, instances of knowledge? What does example one possess that is also possessed by example two and all the ones in the middle all the way until my final example? So. Why is geometry an example of knowledge? Why is astronomy an example of knowledge? What is similar, what kind of property is similar in geometry and astronomy, cobbling, and all these things, such that we say, yep, those are examples of knowledge. So we're looking, just like when a mathematician says, why do these certain numbers, what do they have in common that we call them powers, and how are they different from other numbers? So, we're looking for something common, some kind of property, something that allows us maybe to recognize that, yeah, this is a good example of knowledge. So, and we make the distinction between the example and the common property, because the common property is not identical to the example because it exists in different examples. So it can't be the same thing, but it's important that the example has it in order to be classified as an example of knowledge. So we've got a lot of, shall we say, shape forming. We've asked, Socrates has asked, what is episteme? But he's laid down some guidelines, some rules. If you're going to define it, it can't be defined in this way. That's not an acceptable way to define it. So you can't just enumerate a bunch of things. So that's ruled out. Then he says, your definition should look something like this. Which, is really, which then triggers something in Theotetus. Yeah, I remember that it's mathematics. We were kind of doing something like that. And that Socrates says, yeah, that's right. That is what I'm looking for. Some kind of definition that is uh, going to satisfy or look very similar to what mathematics uh, mathematicians are up to. So that's our first uh, uh, a, a example of the, the shaping of the question by relating it and using mathematics as a kind of model. Now, to get a little more deeper into this, this idea that episteme is going to be related or look kind of like mathematics. Mathematics could be the exemplar, the perfect way of doing uh, or talking about knowledge. We'll look into that in more detail. But he's now got a model of trying to understand what's going to work as a basic answer to this question. So. Stay tuned because we're going to look a little bit more into this, this investigation, this mathematical investigation uh, that leads us 
to the idea that mathematics is the model of knowledge. Stay tuned. <laughs>